1953, the United States started to deploy nuclear weapons in Europe to support NATO against a growing Soviet threat. This deployment provided the impetus for an unprecedented effort to provide security for these weapons of last resort. As early as 1960, it was clear that innovative safety and control devices would be necessary to meet U.S. and NATO political and military requirements. It was critical that nuclear weapons would always be available for use if and only if authorized by the president. And they must never be subject to unauthorized use and must never detonate in an accident. The design features to ensure the safety, security, and reliability now associated with U.S. nuclear weapons did not happen overnight. The significant role of the national laboratories in that deliberate process is the subject of this documentary. Always, never. The assumption was Europe could be defended in one and only one way, and that was through the use of nuclear weapons. In Thule, Greenland, a nuclear bomber crashed, and if that had led to a nuclear explosion, beyond just a scattering of nuclear materials, we would have been very close on the edge of um, nuclear uh, war by accident. The initial weapons that were deployed were for the 280 millimeter cannon. And then shortly after that, there was uh, quite a uh, variety of weapons that were deployed that included not only the nuclear artillery, but the surface-to-surface -surface missiles. Uh, there were dual-capable aircraft. There were air defense artillery. And there was also atomic demolition munitions. Nuclear weapons got at the heart of NATO strategy very quickly from their initial deployment in 1953. Although the exact role, uh, exactly how and when they were going to be used, was often confusing and ambiguous. An historic day for America as President... In 1953, President Eisenhower would make nuclear weapons the centerpiece of national defense and the defense of Western Europe. Eisenhower decided that we were spending too much on the Department of Defense and cut back the planned level of expenditures. This was the new look. Uh, we, in the judgment of the administration, could not stand up against the hordes of Soviet soldiers that would be sent against the West, and therefore nuclear weapons were a substitute for maintaining massive conventional forces. The nuclearization of NATO was codified in MC48, a seminal planning document declaring that NATO forces would be able to initiate immediate defensive and retaliatory operations, including the use of atomic weapons. MC48 also called for the development of forces in being, underscoring the importance of a German contribution. Memories of World War II were very fresh. And so for NATO to make that decision to allow Germany to rearm uh, was a very difficult one. It almost took the whole world to bring Germany down in 1945. And it is this huge, huge weight 
in the balance of power, and and East and West are just really, really worried about which way that that power that country is going to go. That was the linchpin of the Cold War: was whether West Germany would stay firmly in the Western camp, or perhaps have some degree of movement toward a sort of a détente with the Warsaw Pact and with the Soviet Union. But the Allies remained committed to a Germany friendly to the West. By integrating West Germany within a system of European defense based on American nuclear power, NATO believed that German power could be contained. In October 1954, the Allies agreed to make West Germany a member of NATO. And in May 1955, bound by treaty, Chancellor Konrad Adenauer vowed that the Federal Republic of Germany would not produce or possess nuclear weapons. And our job was to ensure that they felt that we could deter Warsaw Pact attack, to assure that the prospect of the war fighting would not uh, be so uh, frightening that uh, the political support for deterrence and for NATO would erode. NATO air forces must be alert at all times. To give them realistic training, a vast maneuver is held in June. Exercise carte blanche in the skies over western Germany. 3,000 aircraft from 11 nations take part. NATO's first war game involving tactical nuclear weapons was intended to demonstrate U.S. resolve and commitment. Twelve installations of the defending Fourth Allied Tactical Air Force are hit, four of them by simulated atomic bombs. Instead, the exercise exposed inherent contradictions of the nuclear battlefield. In the course of the exercise, there were 335 nuclear weapons dropped. There was an estimated 5 million casualties, uh, most of these in Germany. I used to fly over it with some of the Seventh Army people. It would be bad enough with so-called conventional capabilities, but nothing compared to what would happen if we had started using nuclear weapons. A difficulty, of course, was that those battlefield nuclear weapons would be used on German soil. And over time, the Germans would get increasingly restless about the way we were protecting them. The contradictions of the Cold War were well established by Eisenhower's second inaugural. Nuclear weapons would come to be seen as the glue that held NATO together, while their deterrent role would remain confusing and ambiguous. Soon, a second generation of tactical and strategic nuclear weapons would be dispersed in NATO, raising concerns not only about strategy, but also about nuclear safety and control. A new Middle East crisis arises as President Nasser of Egypt tells a wildly cheering crowd in Alexandria that Egypt has seized the internationally owned Suez Canal encircled by units from 15 Red Armored Divisions that have poured into Hungary. Patriots fight to the last ditch. This is the death of liberty in Budapest. Against a backdrop of increasing east-west tensions, and despite deep ambivalence toward battlefield nuclear weapons, NATO planning proceeded apace, and in May 1957, the North Atlantic Council approved a new strategic document. MC-14-2, the massive retaliation strategy, was all that nuclear war. It was nothing short of that. So there was no distinction between tactical and strategic. Everything was going to be used. U.S. nuclear weapons deployed in Europe and closely coupled with forces of the Strategic Air Command would provide NATO with extended nuclear deterrence. Extended deterrence was challenged from Europe by Charles de Gaulle and others when Charles de Gaulle said, will the Americans sacrifice New York for Hamburg? Whether it was de Gaulle or uh, the British or the, uh, the Germans who didn't really believe that they could count on us for that sort of thing. America wouldn't be able to rely on the threat of deliberately, consciously launching a full-scale nuclear attack on the Soviet Union indefinitely. Today, a new moon is in the sky, a 23-inch metal sphere placed in orbit by a Russian rocket. 
one of the great scientific feats of the age. I think people felt that the Soviets were speeding ahead of us in some sense. During the Suez venture, Khrushchev threatened to rain rockets down on Paris and London. Well, he didn't have the rockets to rain down on them at the time, but the Soviets were engaged in exaggerating their capabilities, and to some extent, that influenced our perception. To a large extent, that influenced our perception. It was very easy to move to a worst case mentality and think, oh my God, they're gonna go into production uh, very rapidly and soon have a very large ICBM force. Top secret reconnaissance of the Soviet Union would gradually undermine Khrushchev's boasts of missile superiority and bolster Eisenhower's confidence in the US strategic deterrent. But lacking this new intelligence, NATO political and military leaders shared the public's alarm. Eisenhower didn't want America to be the protector of Europe. So anything that pointed toward uh, an independent, strategically independent, unified Europe, you know, fit in with the Eisenhower policy. Now that clearly meant that the Europeans would have to be armed with nuclear weapons. The idea was to share the nuclear burden and, and also complicate the planning for a Soviet first strike. It would be that much harder for them to overrun NATO if the nuclear retaliation capacity was spread across more countries. At the 1957 emergency summit, Eisenhower agreed to establish a NATO atomic stockpile and offered to station intermediate range ballistic missiles at European bases. These IRBMs would be capable of reaching targets in the Soviet Union and were to be a stopgap until America's intercontinental ballistic missiles were ready. Congress had authorized this nuclear development on the proviso that U.S. would maintain custody of the nuclear weapon. But what did custody mean if the nuclear weapon was hanging under the wing of a German airplane piloted by a German pilot sitting on the tarmac ready to go? And on those bases, we had weapons, our weapons. And they were on a, what was called a quick reaction alert. Four airplanes were supposed to be, when they got the word, be airborne in five minutes. In every case where weapons were deployed to a specific NATO site, there was a U.S. custodial presence. A few individuals, generally young custodians, that, had con that were the legal control of the weapons, embedded with, let's say, the German army. I can remember in the tour of NATO around 1958 that it would be very easy for the host nation or some faction in that nation to take over the nuclear facility. There was concern about foreign nationals, but also about commanders that might use them without proper authority. And of course, the European commander, who was an American commander, was eager to have them under his own control. But if nuclear war was fought, it would be fought with central U.S. systems in according to plan and not in reaction to uh, an event in the theater. In order to be sure of that, there had to be something a little bit better in a crisis situation. In 1958, as John Foster advanced the concept of use control at Livermore, Fred Clay was presenting a confidential report to his colleagues at RAND on the risk of an accidental or unauthorized nuclear detonation. About that time, we started the alert of our bomber force because of the fear of surprise attack, that the bombs could be destroyed on the ground before they took off. But then it occurred to me, you know, uh, a deliberate attack is only one problem we have. If there's an accidental nuclear launch, you cannot dissuade an accident from happening. You have to prevent the accident. We had two basic recommendations. One was a two-man rule. 
At that time, one uh, authorized uh, sergeant from the Air Force uh, could move around a bomb that he could have brought to detonation. He might be psychotic, he might be alcoholic, he might be going through a terrible divorce, uh, he may be sleep deprived and make a, a mistake in the way he's carrying out nuclear weapon safety rules. You need a second person to ensure that these kinds of normal, natural human foibles don't cause some kind of nuclear accident or launch. So we recommended that not just relying on screening of the people in a two-man rule, but also on safety locks, to put it simply. It was a lock that would in turn this otherwise ready-to-go nuclear weapon into a dumb bomb until a code was inserted. And so it is a electrical break or a functional break of critical functions that are in the weapon. An acute need for change in nuclear safeguards and security was emerging independently within the defense community. By 1960, U.S. nuclear weapons were widely deployed to Europe, and Strategic Air Command was preparing for a full-time airborne alert mission. This posture of extended deterrence and high readiness carried with it new risks. Soon, action by Congress and the White House would crystallize around the concept of a coded lock for nuclear weapons that became known as the Permissive Action Link. There were three groups that separately stumbled their way onto thinking we needed something like a permissive action link. One was the labs themselves, then there was the executive branch, and the third group was in Congress, the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy. And the fortunate thing is they all came together at the same time, the late 50s, early 60s. 57 to 62 was a period of, of drastic change to the nuclear arsenal. Particularly after weapons were placed on quick reaction alert uh, in Europe and in the United States. The customer, the military, wanted smaller devices, lighter, uh, lighter devices. And so the Los Alamos folks invented the idea of a sealed pit. When we developed what were called sealed pit weapons, these were weapons where the fissile material was an integral part of the high explosive assembly mechanism. With sealed pits, you then were in a situation where the bomb was always ready to go. Now, as designs evolved and we went to seal pit, when all of the energy sources necessary were in one place, we didn't at first recognize the implications of the electrical system. We need some mechanism to protect us from that electrical energy that stops the flow of electrical energy directly into your, your charging system. In 1958, nuclear safety was an emerging discipline at the Atomic Energy Commission laboratories, and designers at Sandia were challenged to ensure the handling safety of the new sealed pit weapons. This pioneering effort in safety would pave the way for the first permissive action link. One of the things that was done was to try to include in the weapons some device that would determine the weapon was in the actual use environment. That is a device that would maintain a, a degree of electrical isolation within the warhead's electrical system until such time as the weapon sees a unique delivery environment. There is a class of weapon type called ADM, Atomic Demolition Munitions. These munitions were implanted just like a landmine. They had no environment to sense. The storage environment and the use environment were the same. They were just sitting there. And so the Army and the Marines chose to use a three-digit coded lock. Well, that also required someone to come up to the weapon to unlock it. And Sandia was asked to develop an electrical switch. A patterned, controlled switch that could be installed in the ADM and then operated from a distance. 
At that time, they were not thinking about crypto. It was a safety concept, which was then converted over to a PAL-like device. It appeared to be that once the nascent PAL technology existed, coupled with growing concerns about accidental or unauthorized use, that change would be at hand. It was in October of 1960. We talked to a group, and it consisted mostly of majors and lieutenant colonels. After we finished the demonstration, one of them said, well, that's an interesting solution, but we don't have a problem that goes with it. One group was not pushing for this, and that was the military. The military, by and large, were satisfied with the procedures in place in the 1950s. The U.S. military tended to believe that it was necessary to have very high readiness for the sake of deterrence. Civilians often believed that, but often were also ready to sacrifice some readiness for the sake of operational safety or operational security. Eisenhower was much more concerned with operational readiness than he was with issues of civilian control. And readiness meant the control could not be too tight. What the Kennedy administration had inherited with regard to the control arrangements, they may have been, may have been quite surprised. In Washington, Senator Kennedy announces his choice for Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara. In the weeks preceding Kennedy's inaugural, before he and Robert McNamara confronted the hard reality of nuclear geopolitics, members of the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy inspected the custody and control of U.S. nuclear weapons in NATO. Los Alamos physicist Harold Agnew was invited to join this congressional tour. Everybody was in the act with our bombs, uh, all deployed all over Europe. In theory, we were supposed to have control over the weapons which were deployed with other NATO forces. In fact, it was a token custodial arrangement. We've been changing the nuclear arsenal and the NATO deployments drastically since 57. And, and there was reason to pause, have we done everything right? What the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy discovered in December 1960 was wildly more delegated than congressional staffers had intended. Now that NATO really has physical control of the delivery systems, and since we went to QRA, the warheads that are on those delivery systems, are those control elements possible? And it was on one of those trips to one of those installations where I was on an airfield with bombs hung under the wing, one bomb per airplane. I guess what got me was I saw this great big black German cross on the side of it. I walked up to the custodian, one GI, he wasn't even 20 years old, and I asked him, what are you going to do if these guys come running out and they're going to take off and no one has told you that it's all right. He, he wasn't quite sure what he should do. And I said, well, what you ought to do is just shoot at the bombs. There are four of them there hanging on. Shoot those things and don't worry about it. Uh, this idea of a custodian really wasn't very realistic. Could that really be viewed as, as presidential control of the U.S. asset? That's when uh, elements of the United States Congress began to question whether uh, we were operating legally within the framework of these programs of cooperation. The tour of NATO nations marked a turning point in the history of permissive action links. Familiar with the advanced work underway at Sandia, Harold Agnew filed his trip report in January 1961. Harold Agnew was familiar with some of this work because of his association with Don Cotter and others at Sandia. And Harold had been to many briefings at Sandia where MC-1541, this ADM solution, was discussed. And he and others recognized that this switch, if it had as an output, an encrypted code, 
could be used to put presidential authority back in the release process. I went back to the Joint Committee, and uh, with Don Cotter, we made a breadboard outfit, which we demonstrated to the Joint Committee as to what we were going to do. The embryonic PAL technology uh, that Sandia had been working on really as a, as a safety enhancement was seized upon as a solution to the legal dilemma. Another 18 months would pass before the new Kennedy administration would issue a presidential directive on PAL. The matter of sharing U.S. nuclear weapons with NATO allies was a hot topic in the Kennedy White House. The president and his national security advisor, McGeorge Bundy, immediately undertook a review of nuclear command and control. When the Kennedy administration got alerted, the whole question got opened up and, and asked, and it became an entirely different concern, not one of custody, but of presidential uh, release. Well, the president wants to have it both ways. He wants to be able, in the 1960s, to use nuclear weapons first if he feels it is absolutely necessary to protect the United States and our allies. But he wants to make sure that no one else makes that decision for him. Maintaining the cohesion of the Atlantic Alliance was a top priority for the new president. Yet in spring 1961, Kennedy approved a Department of Defense recommendation that no further nuclear weapons should be allocated for support of non-U.S. forces. Ongoing dispersals to NATO were halted, pending the results of further study. Premier Khrushchev arrives in Vienna for the first summit meeting with a U.S. president since the ill-starred conference with President Eisenhower in Paris. The talks go on for two days, and while they came to a limited agreement on Laos, there still appears to be sharp disagreement on Berlin nuclear testing. In early June 1961, when Kennedy and Khrushchev first met, the issues of custody and release authority for nuclear weapons in NATO were at once overshadowed and propelled by the crisis in West Berlin. The attention of an anxious world is focused on East and West Germany and Berlin. At the time, of course, West Berlin was isolated from the rest of the NATO, located in East Germany. One of the most important events was a Soviet attempt to take West Berlin. At the start of the crisis, the National Security Council met to discuss a memo on Berlin by former Secretary of State Dean Acheson. The NSC also discussed steps to strengthen U.S. physical custody of warheads in NATO, as well as preparing war plans for the use of nuclear weapons in Central Europe. The Berlin Task Force was basically saying, well, we would have a nominal response of U.S. forces and then we would have to appeal to nuclear weapons. That scared everyone, including probably the Soviets who had spies on the channels and realized that, that we were contemplating that. I called the SAC your Supreme Allied Commander, who was General Norstad, back to Washington. And I said, look, Larry, they did A, we did B, they did C, we did D. How is this thing going to evolve? He said, well, they'll do E, we'll do F, they'll do G, we'll do H, they'll do I. And I said, what do we do then? He said, well, he said, I guess we have to use nuclear weapons. Now, it was that kind of a situation. A situation in which Khrushchev sought to reverse the balance of nuclear power in Soviet favor by detonating a new super bomb. As Kennedy responded to the crisis, he continued to contemplate the prospect of an accidental or unauthorized nuclear detonation. The basic thrust of the Kennedy policy, of which the PALs were a component, was to make sure that control was exercised by the political leadership. That unless they could be controlled by the president, the president was going to consider pulling all nuclear weapons out of Europe. An accident or an incident at one of those bases, even though it may not be full nuclear or launch, uh, just wasn't in the national interest. The point was we needed something besides just the custodial team with their sidearms to, to invoke control. 
Kennedy remained focused on the stability of NATO, and nuclear weapons were central to maintaining that alliance. On the occasion of Charter Day in March 1962, the president toured Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, where he saw promising new PAL technology. I think that had an impression on President Kennedy, but you need several people providing to the leadership, to the management, uh, some confidence that this is a serious problem and here is a solution to deal with it. We were able to provide prototype working hardware that, that people could understand and get a feel of what it would be in terms of the impact upon the weapons and the weapon systems. A consensus emerged to assure against unauthorized use, the never concept of nuclear weapons. A presidential directive was issued in June 1962, calling for PALs to be installed on all nuclear weapons dispersed to NATO commands for both non-U.S. and U.S. forces. Overall, there was an urgency to equip the NATO stockpile with something that interrupted critical electrical functionality inside the weapon and prevented the normal use of, of, the, of the nuclear device. We had PALs in weapons in Europe, coded switches installed starting in September of that year. NATO was involved in the installation of these weapons and the generation of the code management system. This was really their, their show. Uh, PAL was only an enabling hardware. The first generation PAL devices were motorized versions of the Sergeant Greenleaf lock that we used to find on all of our safes. It was literally uh, a, a combination lock attached to a system of motors and gears that would allow you to remotely manipulate the lock mechanism as opposed to twisting it with your fingers. MC-1541 represented the technology that we had at the time, which was electromechanical. It was a clockwork. You would put in a code, and that would then shift around to see, if, does that number correspond to a stored position of a code wheel? and then you would move to the next digit and do the next code wheel. And finally, when you get down to the fourth digit and you've got all four code wheels lined up, it would allow a gate to come down, which would press on another switch, which would then allow electrical current to flow to the web. Now the PAL device is integrated into the system. It's embedded and buried within the weapon system. And so an adversary would have to find his way down into the weapon system to be able to uh, uh, circumvent or bypass the uh, PAL device. The PAL, of course, is the device to permit administrative control by means of codes. That code could be held separate from the weapon, indeed could be held by the U.S. command authority and shared with the NATO ally only at the very last moment. So you separated the holders of weapons, the people that had, did the daily care and feeding, from those that authorized it. But the people who had to operate those systems initially uh, took it kind of personally. As a besmirching of, of their uh, loyalty and their responsibility. You don't trust us. It was a reflection on uh, faith, so to speak, or trust we had in them. And the other, which was really, uh, I found amusing, was what if we don't get the message? What if we don't get the codes? There were a number of operational issues that had to be addressed because this is a system that required external interaction with weapons support personnel. By the fall of 1962, the first permissive action links were installed on U.S. nuclear weapons in NATO, including those dispersed to U.S. forces on quick reaction alert. Both the Army and the Air Force immediately challenged PAL's reliability. There were problems in terms of the instructions as well as the hardware for charging batteries and storing batteries and those kind of things. I was sent to Europe to understand the specific nature and scope of the problems that the military was having. Not with the hardware that was in the weapons, the permissive action links, but the rest of the system that allowed that to work. 
We did not make uh, proponents immediately out of the services, but we certainly did uh, diffuse the level of, of anger and resentment. In a democracy like the United States, civilian control of the military means civilians must also control the use of nuclear weapons. What the PAL did is separated possession of the weapon from ability to make a nuclear detonation. You could possess the weapon and yet not be able to detonate it, at least not until you had received the PAL code. Initially, permissive action links were intended just for the weapons that would be shared with our NATO allies. But over time, the PAL concept migrated through the rest of the arsenal. So the fail safe box. Well, there must be some mistake. Check Omaha. The situation of concern is a SAC bomber crew launches a nuclear capable aircraft under positive control, flies out somewhere into northern Canada or into the Arctic and flies a turnaround pattern there until he receives a go directive from SAC headquarters. Can't get through, Colonel. And at some point, they would reach a failsafe line. And that line was generally drawn just outside of the air defense radar detection. Their standing rule was to turn around and come back home if they had not received orders to proceed to target. The thought was the high frequency communications that were available at the time uh, were not totally reliable. The crew is out there thinking that nuclear war is beginning or may have already begun. And in fact, may be responsible for the fact that they can't seem to talk to their headquarters. Here was a situation where people could imagine that the crew might work in concert and decide that they were gonna execute the mission without ever having received the presidential authorization. The Air Force was intensely focused on the nuclear mission, particularly in the 60s. So when you have those huge numbers of weapons out there, you have to have two concerns. Your primary concern is somebody accessing a weapon that intends to do you harm from the outside. But you also have the insider problem. One of the concerns in use control is being able to deal with an insider threat. And that's a very difficult thing to deal with. And that was to provide protection against unauthorized releasing of an armed weapon. The Air Force believed that they had in place uh, sufficient controls. They always saw PAL as a complication to the always, an impediment to them doing the job they were they were hired to do. And in fact, they had great faith in their, com their own command control system. Regardless of how much you trust your own people and regardless of what kind of personnel reliability programs you have, if you got that many weapons out there and that many people involved, then you have both the malicious insider concern and then you have the careless insider concern. Many within the defense community questioned whether dependence upon SAC's personnel reliability program and administrative controls were sufficient to prevent an unauthorized release. In 1967, after a high-level DOD review, SAC was directed to equip its bombers with a code-enabling switch. The code-enabling switch was really designed to prevent unauthorized action by an aircraft crew prior to their landing anywhere. Because the code-enabling switch was positioned in a location that it would be very difficult for the crew to get to while the airplane was in flight. If you recall what the function of a PAL is, a PAL is to break critical arming and firing lines. Okay? It's buried deep within the system. A bomber-coated switch, or CES, is just another variant of a PAL just located in the aircraft, and it breaks critical power lines 
to the weapon. By 1970, bomber-coated switches were being fielded in SAC B-52s, and a new generation of permissive action links was evolving to meet the needs of NATO nuclear policy, as well as a changing threat environment. At a time when the Europeans were again questioning U.S. resolve, the Nixon administration considered ways to strengthen NATO's nuclear options. My view was that selective nuclear strikes would persuade the Soviet Union that the United States would not be deterred from using nuclear weapons against Soviet territory. The threat of their use would condition how the Warsaw Pact forces would have to fight conventionally in such a way as to give us a conventional advantage. NATO's policy of flexible response required the capability of the selective release of nuclear weapons, unlocking a few, but not all. The multiple code capability of a new Category D PAL was an enabler of flexible response. Cat D PAL was the first implementation for multiple codes for selective release. They could release a small set of weapons, or they could have the option for release for a theater-wide response. The evolution of PAL devices followed both an increasing desire to provide operational flexibility and a desire to address vulnerabilities. Now, if you think about denying use to personnel that are not supposed to have access, if they ever get access, it, it's a little bit different problem. Use of denial was absolutely important when you looked at taking a weapon from a storage location and now putting it onto a delivery platform itself. During the Cold War, the main focus was always on the adversary, and we would run drills on having to launch. We would run drills on being at a ground attack. By the 1970s, U.S. nuclear weapons were a mainstay of European defense. Use control systems, part of the never of nuclear weapons, had evolved to assure against unauthorized release, but also had to address the question of enemy overrun. And the answer to that was what was called nonviolent disablement. Critical elements of the nuclear weapon are irreversibly damaged reconfigured in such a way that the uh, weapon systems would not be functional uh, without a major reconstruction effort. The function of PAL is to maintain control until custody can be regained. There's no guarantees, but they do provide protection and delays. From ABC headquarters, just outside the Olympic Village in Munich, West Germany, the peace of what have been called the Serene Olympics was shattered just before dawn this morning, about five o'clock, when Arab terrorists went to the headquarters of the Israeli team and immediately killed one man. It was the first real armed terrorism event that caught public attention. Armed, dedicated team, well thought out, well planned, willing to die. Well, that's different than what we'd been dealing with before. We were dealing with, with enemies overrunning our territory. The possibility that terrorists might uh, attempt to uh, steal a U.S. nuclear weapon or even occupy a weapon storage site uh, uh, grew in its importance. The scenario you had to protect against there is a terrorist that seizes a nuclear weapon and then has days, even weeks, to overcome the use control devices. ways were looked at for making the disruption or disablement automatic. An autonomously operating system that senses intrusions into the weapon and invoke uh, disablement automatically. By 1979, the terrorist threat loomed large in NATO planning. 
Studies of nuclear security were undertaken and systems were developed to thwart the actions of terrorists and assaulting forces. The lab engineers kept pace with the evolving threat and by the 80s, the POWs that were being deployed on the new weapons were highly robust against tampering or seizure by terrorists. So the PAL certainly gave us a longer delay time if someone got access to a weapon that shouldn't have access to it. But it also gave you much more comfort that unless people were using the right processes, the right procedures, and were fully authorized, and were doing everything they were supposed to do, you know, that the weapon was more secure. Always to go off when you do need them, never to go off at any other time. These, of course, stress the command and control system. And the history of the nuclear age has been civilians and military wrestling with what civilian control of nuclear weapons means and coming to different understandings in different times shaped by events of the day and shaped by the evolution of technology. triangles are their primary targets, the squares are their secondary targets. The aircraft begin penetrating Russian radar cover within uh, 25 minutes. General Turgidson, I find this very difficult to understand. I was under the impression that I was the only one in authority to order the use of nuclear weapons. Uh, that's right, sir. You are the only person authorized to do so. And although I... Uh, hate to judge before all the facts are in. It's beginning to look like uh, General Ripper exceeded his authority. Dr. Strangelove crystallized the always never problem and the civil military tension that underlay it. And the Strangelove scenario sketches a fanciful and absurd, really, way in which the military might go off the reservation. Uh, I want you to transmit plan R, R for Robert, to the wing. Plan R for Robert. Is it that bad, sir? It looks like it's pretty hairy. Yes, sir. Plan R for Robert, sir. It was about a commander who had been that, authorized to use nuclear command. weapons under certain circumstances, believing that those circumstances had come about, took actions against the wishes of the American president and the American secretary of defense. That was not an entirely far-fetched. It was an unlikely event, but it was not an impossible event at all. The president arrives at Eglin Air Force Base in Florida for a display of aerial might. By General Curtis LeMay, he sees a display of manned weapons. There was a fear on the part of some that uh, the military might be reckless, that they might be prepared in a crisis to use nuclear weapons. Eisenhower had a very different attitude towards this problem than did Kennedy. Eisenhower, as a former military commander, had a great deal of trust in the U.S. military and would often delegate authority down to lower-level commanders. The Eisenhower policy of pre-delegation had led to a situation where the SAC commander could, because of a failure on the phone lines between Washington and Omaha could authorize the use of nuclear weapons in an offensive manner against the Soviet Union, leading to a full-scale nuclear war. President Kennedy, unlike President Eisenhower, did not want that risk to remain. And the permissive action links were a way of establishing clear presidential control. In our academic world, we refer to that as the tension between positive control, do what you're told, and negative control, don't do it until we tell you. It is very hard to assure both sides of that um, dilemma, always and never, at the same time. And in fact, the command and control system at any given point in time and at any given period in the nuclear history has favored one side or the other. Perhaps no single commander and military organization embodied the always never problem more than the enigmatic General Curtis LeMay and his vaunted Strategic Air Command. In 1958, 
LeMay listened with interest to Freddie Clay's RAND report on accidental or unauthorized use. Almost by accident, the then Vice Chairman of the Air Force, General Curtis LeMay, heard about the briefing, and he says, I want to get the briefing. Should there be a nuclear accident in the United States that is blamed on our own forces, what would happen to his Air Force afterwards? And so he was known as a hardliner, as a guy who wanted to have his bombs ready to retaliate massively, but he also knew that this kind of a risk had to be reduced or eliminated. General LeMay dramatized a different problem with the nuclear command and control system. What do you do if all of the civilian leaders are gone? You could design the command and control system so that in such a case, it would fail impotent. Or you could design the system that says in that case, the military can retaliate with nuclear weapons regardless. And General LeMay argued for the latter system. And LeMay said, the pilot's an American, he'll know what to do. For General LeMay, the quantum leap in the destructiveness of nuclear weapons was profound, and he was determined to protect the United States from a bolt from the blue, like that which struck on a clear, hot summer morning. What some would call an absolute weapon focused the tension between military and civilian objectives, immediate availability versus deliberative decision-making about nuclear weapons. In the year following its use in World War II, the foundations of nuclear policy were established. President Truman transferred authority for this uniquely destructive weapon from military to civilian hands, while reserving the ultimate decision for its use to the president. Even at the very beginning, many of the themes that operated during the Cold War and still operate as we consider what to do with nuclear weapons were present. The first and most important one was a recognition that nuclear weapons were different from other military tools. A uniquely destructive weapon that had to be handled in a very different way. The spirit of the arrangement at that time was to keep nuclear weapons under civilian control and separated, if you will, from the operational military commands that would ultimately use them if they were to be used. To assure that uh, a wide range of views would be brought to bear on everything having to do with nuclear weapons. In which there was a division of responsibilities between those who were charged with designing, developing, producing, and manufacturing, and those who were charged with executing them in military operations. The Atomic Energy Act of 1946 created a civilian-led Atomic Energy Commission that would administer civilian and military uses of U.S. atomic power. The act also established clear civilian authority over the use of nuclear weapons vested in the president. And presidential authorization for use has continued to this day as the central feature of nuclear weapon command control. Over time, the balance between assertive presidential control and its delegation to the military varied with each administration. In 1987, President Reagan formalized nuclear command and control policy, assuring authorized use of nuclear weapons and assuring against unauthorized or inadvertent use. During the Cold War, it was our overriding concern that our forces be survivable to a first strike. In order to manage that risk, we had to accept other risks. You know, I mean, this, this business is all about risks. 
Doing that, you have to consider the, that the weapons should always be ready to maintain deterrence, but they should never be available for unauthorized uh, use or uh, never be subject to an accident. Political leaders need to think about where do they feel comfortable in this continuum between safety and reliability. And that's a delicate balance. During the Cold War, to manage the risks and strike a balance between always and never, the three Atomic Energy Commission nuclear laboratories continually evolved new technologies, improving the safety, control, reliability, and performance of nuclear weapons. Historically, developments in these different areas were often out of step with one another and with operational realities. As an agent of both always and never, technology would create new capabilities and spawn unexpected challenges. An historic day for America as president... In 1953, President Eisenhower would make nuclear weapons the centerpiece of national defense and the defense of Western Europe. Eisenhower decided that we were spending too much on the Department of Defense and cut back the planned level of expenditures. This was the new look. Uh, we, in the judgment of the administration, could not stand up against the hordes of Soviet soldiers that would be sent against the West. And therefore, nuclear weapons were a substitute for maintaining massive conventional forces. The nuclearization of NATO was codified in MC-48, a seminal planning document declaring that NATO forces would be able to initiate immediate defensive and retaliatory operations, including the use of atomic weapons. MC-48 also called for the development of forces in being, underscoring the importance of a German contribution. Memories of World War II were very fresh. And so for NATO to make that decision to allow Germany to rearm uh, was a very difficult one. It almost took the whole world to bring Germany down in 1945. And it is this huge, huge weight in the balance of power and and east and west are just really really worried about which way that that power that country's going to go that was the linchpin of the cold war was whether west germany would stay firmly in the western camp or perhaps have some degree of movement toward a sort of a detente with the warsaw pact and with the soviet union but the allies remained committed to a germany friendly to the west by integrating West Germany within a system of European defense based on American nuclear power, NATO believed that German power could be contained. In October 1954, the Allies agreed to make West Germany a member of NATO, and in May 1955, bound by treaty, Chancellor Konrad Adenauer vowed that the Federal Republic of Germany would not produce or possess nuclear weapons. And our job was to ensure that they felt that we could deter Warsaw Pact attack, to assure that the prospect of the war fighting would not uh, uh, be so uh, frightening that uh, the political support for deterrence and for NATO would erode. NATO air forces must be alert at all times. In 1953, the United States started to deploy nuclear weapons in Europe to support NATO against a growing Soviet threat. This deployment provided the impetus for an unprecedented effort to provide security for these weapons of last resort. As early as 1960, it was clear that innovative safety and control devices would be necessary to meet US and NATO political and military requirements. 
it was critical that nuclear weapons would always be available for use if and only if authorized by the president. And they must never be subject to unauthorized use and must never detonate in an accident. The design features to ensure the safety, security, and reliability now associated with U.S. nuclear weapons did not happen overnight. The significant role of the national laboratories in that deliberate process is the subject of this documentary. Always, never. The assumption was Europe could be defended in one and only one way, and that was through the use of nuclear weapons. In Tula, Greenland, a nuclear bomber crashed, and if that had led to a nuclear explosion, beyond just a scattering of nuclear materials, we would have been very close on the edge of um, nuclear uh, war by accident. The initial weapons that were deployed were for the 280 millimeter cannon. And then shortly after that, there was uh, quite a uh, variety of weapons that were deployed that included not only the nuclear artillery, but the surface-to-surface -surface missiles. Uh, there were dual-capable aircraft. There were air defense artillery. And there was also atomic demolition munitions. Nuclear weapons got at the heart of NATO strategy very quickly from their initial deployment in 1953. Although the exact role, uh, exactly how and when they were going to be used, was often confusing and ambiguous. To give them realistic training, a vast maneuver is held in June. Exercise carte blanche in the skies over western Germany. 3,000 aircraft from 11 nations take part. NATO's first war game involving tactical nuclear weapons was intended to demonstrate U.S. resolve and commitment. Twelve installations of the defending Fourth Allied Tactical Air Force are hit, four of them by simulated atomic bombs. Instead, the exercise exposed inherent contradictions of the nuclear battlefield. In the course of the exercise, there were 335 nuclear weapons dropped. There was an estimated five million casualties. Uh, most of these in Germany. I used to fly over it with some of the Seventh Army people. It would be bad enough with so-called conventional capabilities, but nothing compared to what would happen if we had started using nuclear weapons. A difficulty, of course, was that those battlefield nuclear weapons would be used on German soil. And over time, the Germans would get increasingly restless about the way we were protecting them. The contradictions of the Cold War were well established by Eisenhower's second inaugural. Nuclear weapons would come to be seen as the glue that held NATO together, while their deterrent role would remain confusing and ambiguous.